Okay, well, I'm going to start with a slightly contentious point, which I'm not going to discuss in a great deal of detail in the presentation, but we can discuss later on. Um, which is that wooded places, forests, woodlands are um, central to a lot of uh, literary imagination, uh, imaginings of how we relate to the natural world. Um, the, loc the location for a lot of uh, classical creation myths, for uh, Renaissance romances, American transcendentalism. Uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring opens with a blaze of colour uh, um, from oak, maple, birch and pine forests. Uh, phenomenologists find themselves in the forest. Heidegger um, famously lived in the Black Forest and draws a lot of his images from the forest. Uh, trees have been seen as sacred or profane. Uh, forests have been the territory of kings or uh, the hiding place of criminals. And uh, since the Second World War, and, and a little bit before, but um, certainly since then, uh, poets who write about forests have become increasingly aware of uh, deforestation and um, increasingly linking exploitation of the forest as a resource with um, exploitation of the people um, who maybe live uh, in the forest or near the forest or just um, indigenous groups that are exploited. Um, W.S. Merwin's maybe a, a case in point. Um, when he writes about the Vietnam War, um, it's an ecological and a humanitarian uh, atrocity that he's talking about in, uh, in the Lice and other 1960s collections. Uh, trees are also symbols of resistance. Um, they're the front line of um, how we think about the natural world and their loss um, is both in intrinsically terrible and also um, has consequences for, for humans. Um, today I'm going to look at uh, the poetry of Susan Stewart that I think is representative of um, some of these trends that I've found in uh, recent poetry um, in writing about the forest. She draws on ideas of the destruction of the forest um, and also uh, as a site of resistance, as a place of dwelling um, uh, in a similar way maybe to Kathleen Jamie's work uh, in some places, occasionally perhaps John Burns' side as well. Uh, she draws on the influence of eco-critics such as Robert Polk Harrison, um, his book on forest in the early 90s, a kind of classic on it. Uh, and Jonathan Bate, too, in turn, has drawn from uh, Harrison's work. Uh, so Susan Stewart uh, is an American poet and academic. She was born in 1952. She's been the Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. Um, she's had six collections uh, published of poetry. Uh, in 1995, she published The Forest, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and she teaches at Princeton University now. Stuart's forest is a place of ambiguity, of collapsing distinctions, uh, things are half seen or half understood in the changing light in the forest. It's a place of sensory exploration, um, all the senses are needed in order to try and get an apprehension of what the place is like. Uh, it's a place where subconscious knowledge comes to the fore as well, and crucially in her poetry it's a place that's under threat. A way of uh, approaching her collection, The Forest, especially the title poem, which I'll come to later, is through the poem Holzwege, which comes halfway through the collection. Apologies to any German speakers for my pronunciation. Um, the title of the poem comes from Heidegger. Uh, his essays, um, one collection was published as Holzwege. Uh, the epigraph is his own, and it's excerpt number one on the handout. I'll just read it. Wood is an old name for forest. In the wood, there are paths mostly overgrown, that come to an abrupt stop where the wood is untrodden. They are called Holtzwege. Each goes its separate way, though within the same forest. It often appears as if one is identical to another, but it only appears so. Woodcutters and forest keepers know these paths. They know what it means to be on a Holtzweg. So Holtzweg literally is a forest path it leads to a clearing where timber is cut, uh, unless it's overgrown, in which case it leads nowhere. Uh, translators of a recent edition, the edition I'm quoting uh, on the handout of, of Heidegger, have translated Holzweg as off the beaten track, is how they term the book. They point out uh, a German idiom, to be on a Holzweg means uh, something like to be on the wrong track, to be barking up the wrong tree. Um, and if, uh, depending on your opinion of Heidegger's politics, you might think that's more appropriate uh, sometimes. Um, but Stuart, anyway, engages with the idea of Holzweg, um, regardless of any criticism, how we might see it as a concept, and it's a very loose concept. Heidegger's concern with how humans live on Earth without dominating it, 
poetry restores our experience of the world by showing the essential nature of things. Uh, the thinker, like the poet, should approach the world like following forest paths. So sometimes we'll follow dead ends or double back. Overall knowledge of the forest is gained by uh, following these paths rather than by doing a taxonomy of trees or counting species or something like that. So uh, if you'll let me take one forest track for the minute into Susan Stewart's poetry and return to the poem Holtzfeig that she's written. She spells it differently from Heidegger. Uh, it's excerpt two on the handout. I took a long walk through the chestnuts. The truth of the light of day just above me where one wing was replaced by another, then halted, as if a key had been barreled over and over to no effect or closure in its lock. I thought of the dead ends, the little alleys leading to the forum, regardless of the turn or seeming intention I might have told myself. I turned. As you can see, the speaker is in a chestnut wood. Uh, their journey is halting, they're turning a lot, and truth is just out of reach. Now, the poem is almost a sestina. Uh, it's six stanzas of six lines. The end words in each stanza are repeated in different orders in the, in the following stanzas, and it's followed by a, a short stanza of three lines, which rounds up all these words. Um, so she repeats the end words with some variations, and especially cute one in the poem, um, the word alleys in the first stanza recurs as alleluia and allegory um, later in the poem. But there are some exceptions to this scheme, which is why I don't really want to call the form a sestina uh, proper. In this poem, meanings and perspectives and senses constantly shift uh, and refract in the wood. Uh, the speaker obsessively returns to images, to a key, to closure or closeness, and to the truth. Because this is a poem about knowledge or the process of trying to know. Uh, the poem follows paths that may or may not lead to knowledge. And as a reader, we're pretty much uh, as much in the dark as the speaker. It's kind of difficult to work out exactly what's going at different stages in this poem. And at the end of the poem, the speaker is left rummaging for a key, and the key is truth. Um, the poem ends with an act of finding out, but it's really unclear what's been found out. And to some extent, nothing's really been found out other than the speaker's preoccupations. Um, so it's kind of an abstract way of knowing the wood um, without knowing exactly what's going on. And the title poem of the collection, The Forest, is also characterised by these repetitions. We're going round in circles a lot uh, in the different lines of the poem. For example, the opening line, you should lie down now and remember the forest, is echoed in the next stanza. Uh, of the poem, and the word remember recurs throughout the poem. Uh, two lines from each stanza recur in the next uh, stanza in a slightly different order, and this goes on all the way through the poem, which means that progress through the forest as a poem and as a forest is slow and it's halting. I'm just going to read the start of the poem. You should lie down now and remember the forest, for it is disappearing. No, the truth is, it is gone now. And so what details you can bring back might have a kind of life. Not the one you had hoped for, but a life you should lie down now and remember the forest. Nonetheless, you might call it in the forest. No, the truth is, it is gone now, starting somewhere near the beginning, that edge. Now, as you can see, this poem has a similar sort of trajectory to Holtzberg. Uh, the speaker is leading uh, the listener, a character in the poem, uh, through a forest, or rather through the memory of a forest. And there's a tension between the repetition and the order and the sort of formal tightness of some of the things in the poem uh, and a lack of any clear meaning to it. Um, but this is a forest of shifting meanings and contradiction where nothing's really quite clear again. And this is all part of the Holtzweig experience of this poem. Simple statements contradict each other. So the first layer of the forest is described as it were firm underfoot, for that place is a sea. When you're reading it, you get the sensation of the, the ground getting way underneath you and you're suddenly in a place of flux where you thought you were maybe in certainty before. The route through the poem doesn't lead to a clearing. Meanings are in flux, things are half seen, things are half understood. But our journey through the forest is rich in sensory perceptions. If you look at uh, excerpt four, I'm not going to read it aloud, but um, some of the things I'll quote come from that stanza. 
Um, the details that we're asked to bring back of the forest involve all the senses. The ground is a black hummus, uh, so you get smell, touch and vision going on there. The air uh, is a texture of drying moss, uh, on which there is a musk from the mushrooms and scalloped moulds. You get touch, smell and taste. Uh, there's an image which I've not quoted um, of flecked birds singing, which is visual and oral. So to get a sense of what's going on in the forest, we need to use all our senses. But the poem itself is also very, um, is playing on the senses. Uh, if you read it aloud, it sounds wonderful. Um, very densely constructed, there's repetitions and rhymes and half rhymes. Um, it speeds up and slows down. Um, there's one point where um, the listener is um, tangled in brambles. And the way I read that aloud anyway, I trip over it a little bit and slow down as the, as the character in the poem does. So the poem's construction adds to the whole sensory experience of being in this forest. The forest is also, in Stuart's poem, uh, a place of subconscious knowledge. She brings, um, she brings in sexual imagery throughout the poem uh, and draws attention to the connotations. Uh, there's a line that's repeated twice, you can understand what I am doing when I think of the entry. Um, there's also a low branch swinging, uh, which is a little bit unsettling. But we're in what um, Robert Polk Harrison would describe as um, the sexualized forest of uh, the goddess Artemis. It's a place where boundaries collapse and ambiguity reigns. If I can just follow a different path through the forest for a minute. Uh, Susan Stewart is a scholar as well as a poet and she often practices what she preaches in her criticism. And one essay from I think the early 80s uh, is a good way into looking at this poem which came significantly later. It's called The Epistemology of the Horror Story. And if you just bear with me, Stewart characterises the horror genre as a narrative of unfolding, of hesitation, of the step and of the key. Um, for Stuart, the horror story amplifies the significance of an event uh, through repetition. Uh, the character and the reader in a horror story are not in control of what's happening. You're led down dark alleyways or through a haunted house. Um, you have to navigate diversions and false turns. And there's a tension in a horror story between the range of possible outcomes, what can happen, and the time that remains. There's often, um, you know, something must be solved by midnight before the spell wears off. That sort of tension is uh, often, Stuart says, inherent in a horror story. And finally, what Stuart says about a horror story is that um, it takes place in a liminal setting, uh, somewhere she describes as being between nature and culture. So the examples she gives of this sort of setting are a suburb, uh, a haunted house, or a wood. A wood, she says uh, in this essay, is part garden, part wilderness. And the issue at stake in a horror story is our understanding of the world. Uh, cognitive faculties, social assumptions are all suspended. Uh, the ability to know what's real and what is false um, is blurred in a horror story, or at least in short, Stuart's reading of a horror story. And in her poem, The Forest, these aspects of a horror story are all in play and uh, the risks are the same. Repetition slows the progress through the forest. The meanings of words and phrases are elusive or contradictory. Uh, the reader and the listener in the poem are read trance-like through the forest. So they're not in control of what's going on. They're told to imagine certain aspects of a forest. Um, you know, we don't come up with those ourselves. Um, it's in a liminal setting, obviously, um, by her own definition. But most importantly, the poem takes place in the knowledge of the loss of forests. Um, so there's a time limit on what can be experienced. The whole thing's framed by uh, the opening stanza. You should lie down now and remember the forest, for it is disappearing. The journey through the forest will end um, as the poem ends. Twice uh, the phrase also in the poem, in the forest, is in inverted commas, which uh, I think draws attention to it as a constructed narrative. It's uh, not a current event, but it's something that's kind of a memory or um, some sort of social construct. Um, so Stuart in the poem recalls the past, the forest, from the future in order to mourn what's being lost in the current age, the age of the reader um, and the poet. Um, the narrative takes place in a world where there's no longer any forests and that takes with it all the sensory uh, perceptions, uh, subconscious knowledge that that's brought to uh, humans. Uh, the loss of sensory appreciation of the world is a big thing in Stuart's poetry and in her criticism. One of her books is Poetry and the Fate of the Senses. 
um, something that overshadows our work throughout. Um, it's part of the reason why our poems are often very formal, complicated, very densely constructed, and also why they draw on ritual and myth. Um, as an aside, the next uh, sequence of poems in the collection are a very detailed observation of um, uh, slaughtering, butchering of animals, livestock for food, um, and they're all done in sonnets and in painstaking, almost gruesome detail. Um, but for Stuart, human nature is part of the wider natural world, and our refusal to take uh, our place in relation to it is devastating for us uh, uh, as people. In the forest, it's not just a forest that's being lost, but also truth, uh, a narrative that will be forgotten uh, when there's no longer any forest remaining. The poem ends, once we were lost in the forest, so strangely alike and yet singular too, but the truth is, it is lost to us now. And the phrase in the final line, uh, truth is, is reflexively reconsidered by the next clause. Um, it draws our attention to the idea of truth itself, not just to a forest. So if being lost in a forest, being on a Holzweg, no longer exists, then thought itself, for Stuart, doesn't exist anymore. Stuart has argued in her critical work that the aesthetic qualities of poetry can counter oblivion. It's a fairly melodramatic statement, but um, this poem ends in silence. It doesn't end encountering anything, really. Um, all that's contingent on the speaker, uh, the navigation of the forest, the existence of the forest itself, that all ends when the narrative voice ends. So the final vision is a forest that's being lost. This loss is the loss of a place of ambiguity, a place of the senses, a place to come to know yourself and your place in the wider natural world. Um, sure, it doesn't offer any solutions. She just offers a warning. If you'll just let me end by reading the end of the poem. Sometimes I imagine us walking there and quickening below lie the sharp brown blades, the disfiguring blackness, then the bulbed phosphorescence of the roots. But perhaps the other kind where the ground is covered so strangely alike and yet singular too, below pliant green needles, the piney fronds. Once we were lost in the forest, so strangely alike and yet singular too, but the truth is, it is lost to us now.